Hello, I'd like to welcome everybody to our biology class. These video recordings can be found on YouTube and the links for them should be found in D2L. We're going to start on chapter one in our book, Biology Concepts and Applications, the eighth edition, with uh, the chapter Invitation to Biology to get us started. You can follow along with me in the book, in your own copy of notes, uh, jotting down notes as we go. At the end, you should expect a chapter test that you should be able to complete after reading the chapter and going through the notes, as well as our lab time on Monday nights. We start off at the beginning of chapter one with a little section that I enjoyed reading, The Secret Life on Earth. In today's day and age, it's hard to imagine that there's things that we don't actually know about out there, or in the case in the book that they talk about, that there's actually species that we have not discovered yet, that there's places in this world that it's really hard for humans to get to, in places like Indonesia, Madagascar, where the jungle is so thick that you can't just take a step forward. You have to literally cut your way through to get in there. So obviously, humans haven't been there in a lot of places in those areas. And there's organisms there, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, protists, just waiting to be discovered. And who knows what secrets they actually have that, uh, in human speaking, um, what could they provide for us that might help us understand life on Earth, ourselves, or even contribute to medically. This chapter makes us consider, like, what do we actually consider to be life? Biology is the study of life, but what is life? How do we know when we come across something that it actually is alive? If we were to be able to someday go to another planet and encounter something, how would we actually know that it was indeed living? That is one of the questions that we'll answer within this chapter. You may already have ideas of your own. Here it says that hundreds of species are actually discovered each year, but uh, sadly, thousands become extinct due to our activities. Our book gives us the data that every year about uh, 20 species become extinct every minute in just the rainforest alone. And those are the only ones, or those are ones that we we know about and that current rate is way too high it's a thousand times faster than what should be normal for earth and it's thought that human activities are responsible for that something we need to consider as a dominant species on earth what can we do about that When we study biology, we think of it as uh, different levels of organization from such as the smallest atom up to the organism itself or even at higher levels such as a global level. And we'll talk about those things in a minute. The idea of emergent properties is also very prominent in biology. The thought that complex properties, including life, often emerge from the interactions of the much smaller parts. With life, we find that it actually emerges at the cellular level. We don't actually consider something like just an atom alive or a proton or an electron in order to have life or its beginnings. We must at least have a cell. Biology is the study of life. Throughout our studies, we'll be taking a look at prefixes and suffixes, where the prefix bio 
does indeed mean life, and an ology is a study of something. So let's take a look at these levels of life that scientists study. All matter does consist of atoms. We've known that for quite a long time, even 2,000 years ago. There were scientists who were thinking of that very important concept back then, that atom, or the, excuse me, that life and all things consist of similar building blocks, and those are called atoms. Then, to go up to the next level, you combine your atoms into molecules. Molecules then make up our next level, which are called macromolecules. Life is made out of about four main macromolecules. Very importantly, they're proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. And macromolecule simply just means big molecules. Macromolecules then make up the cells where we see the beginnings of life. Cells make up tissues, tissues make up organs, organs make up organ systems, and then we arrive at the actual organism. Here we have a, a term slide, the definitions of the terms that I just stated. And the same again. But then we can build even further from an organism level, a group of organisms living together, being able to breed with one another successfully. It's called a population. Populations then build communities which are different species living in an area, interacting with one another. Those then may make up an ecosystem, an area or an environment that has all of its living and non-living things within it and uh, certain climatic attributes and then those, all the ecosystems of the earth, then make up the biosphere. Take a look at the word biosphere. We have uh, the prefix bio, again, meaning life. It's like the sphere of life around earth. It goes up so far into the atmosphere, so down into the crust of the earth and biosphere is the area where life can actually exist on earth. The nature of science is that we understand life by studying it at different levels of its organization, the levels that we just mentioned from atoms and molecules to the organism all the way to the biosphere and the quality we call life emerges at the level of cells at the cell level we can actually consider that something is alive. Our next area of notes um, lets us start thinking about what can we actually call the characteristics of life. What do all living things have in common? So you may have an idea in your own mind as you uh, encounter things. How do I actually know that it's alive? Well, these are the ideas that scientists and biologists have. First of all, energy. Organisms need to take in energy, such as consuming food, and they have to use it. Organisms sense and respond to change. All organisms, I find this um, very interesting that um, no matter what organism you are, we all have the same basic uh, genetic blueprint. Uh, we have DNA. Back to the energy theme the way organisms get their energy. 
we have those that have the special ability to make their own energy from sunlight and some other raw materials in a process called photosynthesis. We call those producers. Our producers on Earth, yes, are plants, but there's also producers that we don't think of, such as the blue-green algae, also called cyanobacteria, and uh, other protists. Then we have those of us that we can relate to who don't have the ability to do photosynthesis. We have to get our food, and so we consume it. We're called consumers. We eat other organisms, including plants and animals, funguses, bacteria, etc. And then, of course, we all, no matter who we are, we create waste. Uh, one thing I would like to say here, uh, sometimes we don't uh, think of plants and other producers as having to do some of the same processes as, uh, as us, but uh, they do. All organisms uh, do have to eat. We, we all need our sources of energy uh, for plants. They just make it themselves. They make their sugar in the form of glucose and then they're able to store it and use it when needed. And consumers then can take advantage of those little storage areas within plants by eating them and therefore are called consumers. A little theme that I always like to think of when I think about life is that uh, energy flows and matter cycle. If you remember back to the laws of thermodynamics, energy isn't created or destroyed, it's transferred from one form to the next. Energy flows, um, in the case of life, can flow from one organism to the next. Materials, though, recycle, such as the water cycle or the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, from one place to the next. Sometimes it's within a living organism and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's in rock, sometimes it's in water. It's uh, interesting to say that uh, an atom of carbon that was once in a dinosaur could now be within you because of the fact that materials such as carbon cycle. Our other idea of life, organisms sense and respond to change. This process is called homeostasis. I like to think of it as a, a dynamic balance that organisms need to maintain certain parameters with their internal environment. That is homeostasis, such as think of yourself uh, when you go outside in the winter and you're not dressed warm enough, what do you start doing? Well, you start shivering. First of all, your teeth chatter, your muscles start contracting involuntarily, whether you like it or not. That's your body trying to maintain homeostasis, trying to bring you back to the parameter of whatever temperature you should be as humans, 98.6 Fahrenheit. That's just an example of your body doing what it should, one of the characteristics of life. All organisms share a common genetic blueprint, and that's DNA. This contains the information that we need to do everything within our body, from our metabolic activities, from our growing, our developing, and our reproduction being able to pass that information down to our next generation so that our next generation has the same traits or similar traits to what we have that made us successful as a species. And sometimes even traits that aren't so good. That does happen as well. Yet, not all DNA or not all genetic blueprints are the same. That's what we call variation and is one of those wonderful things with humans. We look out as humans, we, we know what, that we're the species of human, but 
there are differences that we can tell apart each other. DNA does stand for, I love this word, deoxyribonucleic acid. It is a pretty big molecule. If we could take out the DNA from one nucleus of a cell, it would be about two meters long. It's a very big molecule and very elaborately put together. We'll talk about that throughout our biology class this semester. It does carry our hereditary information that guides our growth and our development. Growth is increasing in size, um, number and volume of cells. Development is a little more complex. It's the way in which cells actually develop into what they'll become. Um, think about how we all begin as a little uh, blob of cells called a zygote and that it, within that blob of cells they group off into what they're going to become such as this little group becomes your nervous system, your brain, this little group becomes your heart and can actually start beating quite early on within your development. So once again development a little more complex than just the word growth. Reproduction, how we make more many different types of reproduction that you may not know about from being able to reproduce by yourself which is called asexual reproduction to needing a partner which is sexual reproduction. There are actually many simple animals who can reproduce by themselves. Many of us know bacteria can do that but there's certain animals that can do that as well and plants can do both. Inheritance, it's like continuity, um, being able to pass your information, your DNA, your genetic code onto your offspring so they have similar traits to you. Life's unity, all organisms consist of one or more cells that take in energy and raw materials to stay alive. We all respond and sense stimuli and function and reproduce with the help of DNA. But how do we differ? We looked at things that make us similar, but how are we different? The difference is, here we see that prefix again, bio, which means life. Biodiversity is our differences among living things, or the other word that we have here, variation. We have some of our uh, different kingdoms of life here from bacteria. They do make up their own kingdom of life. Archaeans, another kingdom of life. Both of these are single-celled organisms. They do have DNA, but it's not within a nucleus. So we give these group of organisms or this group of organisms a special name and now you can see that I've actually taken a little time to write with my mouse there that uh, these two groups here, bacteria and archaeans, are called prokaryotes because of the fact that they are different from us in that their DNA is not contained within a nucleus. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, are very complex. They have their DNA within a nucleus. Uh, some are single-celled, like protists or uh, the yeast, which are a type of fungi. And then plants and animals are all multi-celled. Again, we're called eukaryotes, and we share that commonality with protists, plants, and fungi. We have our terms, bacterium, archaeans. These are both types of bacteria. Uh, the bacterium, singular for bacteria, are what we think of when we think of bacteria like E. coli or strep bacteria. Archaeans are, a member, are members of bacteria that are very different and they seem to be extreme, 
meaning they live in places that many other organisms would not be able to live, such as in hot springs or salty environments or very cold environments. They're just very different. In fact, they used to be part of the bacteria kingdom. Now they get their own kingdom because they are indeed so different. A nucleus is a double membrane sac that encloses a cell's DNA. Some cells have one, some have many, including our muscle cells have many. We call that multinucleated. And a eukaryote is an organism's who, organism whose cells character, characteristically have a nucleus. Um, and remember, I wrote the word prokaryote a little earlier, which does include the archaeans and the bacteria. Protists, I love the protist kingdom because they're so diverse. It's kind of like we figured out what all the other kingdoms are from plants who we know they can do photosynthesis and they're the base of our food chain, the fungi who are the decomposers, the animals who go around eating other organisms. But uh, there were this group that, what do we really do with them? Some of them have animal-like qualities, some of them have plant-like qualities, some even have fungi-like qualities. And so they got their own little kingdom called the protists. They include organisms like amoeba, uh, euglena, which are a type of algae. Um, you may have heard of paramecium. We'll talk about those later on in the course. But uh, they are kind of one of my favorite kingdoms because of their diversity. Fungi obtain their nutrients by digestion and absorption outside the body. Uh, yeast are an example of a single-celled fungus, but uh, most others are all uh, multi-celled because they're doing their digestion outside of their body and then they absorb what they digest. That's why they tend to look so yucky like they do. Plants, because they contain chlorophyll, are able to photosynthesize their own sugar. And then animals are multi-celled. All of us are multi-celled consumers. And uh, we develop through a series of different stages in our life. Life is um, very similar with those underlying characteristics such as needing energy, being able to reproduce, maintaining homeostasis, growing and developing, etc. But life's diversity are the things that allow us to keep track of who's who, what species is what. And the diversity is one of those things that we get to enjoy as we look at life and ponder it as maybe only humans can do. Now we come to an area of our chapter where we kind of focus on not only those similarities and differences with life and we try to classify it as humans. That's one of the things we like to do is classify and make sense of what's around us. And so if you are a taxonomist then in science that means you classify things, you classify life. One of our first taxonomists was Carolus Linnaeus. He lived in the 1700s and sorted species into taxa, which are groups of organisms that have shared traits. He also introduced giving living things a scientific name, which included a genus and a species. When we write a genus, and I'm going to try to write this on my computer screen, we always capitalize the genus. So you might already get an idea of who I'm talking about here if I say Homo sapien. Genus here is capitalized species is lowercase. And basically, uh, these words here, they do look kind of foreign to us, obviously, for those of us that speak English. Uh, they are Latin, sometimes Greek. 
So they do have a meaning, of course, in another language, but it was decided that since Latin was a dead language at the time, that that would be a good one to use because it doesn't change much. So any any scientist around the world communicating a species with another scientist should use this language, this two-name system, the genus and species. That way we know exactly what organism it is that we're talking about. In a two-naming system like this, we call this binomial nomenclature. Again, a species is a type of organism. If you're in the same species with someone, that means that you can reproduce with them. And not just enough to reproduce, but you create what are called viable fertile offspring, meaning that the offspring are strong enough to be able to survive and then reproduce as well, such as the example of uh, say a lion and a tiger making a liger. Uh, the liger is kind of a dead end. Yes, it's a living organism, but it's unable to reproduce. Therefore, lions and tigers are different species. Similar enough DNA to reproduce, but not make viable fertile offspring together. A genus is a group of species that share a unique set of traits. Also the first part of our species name that is capitalized. A specific epithet is the second part of the species name. And again, those usually have meanings ground in Latin or Greek. Taxonomy, the science of naming and classifying species as we saw in the beginning of our chapter, that we actually do discover new species each year, so there are still species needing to be classified. And uh, taxonomy does change as we learn more about the organisms that we know about, we learn more about life on Earth, we do indeed change our classification schemes. When considering a species, we look at what things does that group of organisms share? What group of traits do they share? There's morphological traits. Those are traits of such a shape of the body, certain um, physical features, physiological traits. How does their, their body work inside? How do their systems work? And then behavioral speed, uh, excuse me, behavioral traits. Sometimes a species can be hard to distinguish. Uh, this is what we call the biological species concept. Again, that you're able to make viable fertile offspring. I'm actually going to write that down because I, I like that quote. Viable. So I'm writing with my mouse here, fertile fix my E there, offspring. And again, that is part of the biological species concept. There are some times, uh, or some scientists that do look at uh, species being the same based on their ecology or based on their morphology, but most scientists use the biological species concept that in order to be considered a, a species, you do indeed need to be able to create offspring first, and then those offspring should be able to grow up and be fertile and produce offspring of their own. A next area of our chapter, we look at how scientists actually do their work. What are some of the practices that they follow? So we call that the nature of science. Critical thinking is very important in science. It's one of the things that we'll practice when we have our lab nights. Judging the quality of information before accepting it. Scientists, number two, make and test potentially falsifiable predictions about how the natural world works. 
Uh, you might know those predictions as hypotheses. And there I wrote the word hypothesis for you. Scientists also addresses only what is observable. Um, scientists do not uh, consider the supernatural or supernatural explanations to explain phenomena. Generally, a researcher observes something in nature, and then they use inductive reasoning to form a hypothesis for it, and then they use deductive reasoning to make a prediction about what might occur if the hypothesis is not wrong. So a hypothesis should be a testable explanation of a natural phenomena. Inductive reasoning is drawing a conclusion based on observation, for instance, if I notice that every morning the sun comes up in the east, it's always coming up in the same place, then I might use inductive reasoning from making all those observations each day that the sun does indeed rise in the east. So that's an a example of inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning um, many times is known as an if comma then statement. An example that I can think of with a if then statement, if I was doing an experiment, let's say with a certain group of arthropods like the little roly-poly pill bugs that some of us like to play with when we were kids, uh, we might uh, be trying to figure out what type of environment they like so uh, we see them always going to the moist area. So I might say, well, if uh, pill bugs like moist areas, then I should be able to find greater numbers of them in the moist area, such as if I'm doing a lab on animal behavior. That might be something that I test. Predictions are tested with observation, experiments, or both. One of my uh, favorite parts of science then, experiments, typically then are performed on an experimental group and then compared with a control group. And then sometimes we do have to resort to models. Maybe, uh, for instance, we can't see something such as an atom or the solar system, so we use a model to help explain those uh, ideas. In our group, such as if, if we're doing an experiment in a lab, let's say that we are uh, testing the growth of plants. So uh, one thing we'll want to make sure that we do is have our, our control group. We don't expose them to what's called the independent variable or the thing that's being tested. And we keep all parameters the same, such as the amount of water, where they're growing, how much sunlight they get. And in the experimental group, we change one thing or we expose them to something different that the control group does not get exposed to. So that would be called the experimental or the treatment group. Conclusions then are drawn from the experimental results or data. The hypothesis that is not consistent with the data is then modified. Making, testing, and evaluating hypotheses is indeed the scientific method. Something that scientists from around the world need to follow when doing experimentation.
Biological systems are usually influenced by many interacting variables. The independent variable influences a dependent variable. Many times when you see a graph, the independent variable usually does go on the bottom and the dependent variable goes on the y-axis. For instance, time could be a very common independent variable. In that plant experiment that I was just talking about, um, maybe we're looking at the height of the plants over time. And the height depends on the time. Time is the independent variable, height then the dependent variable. The nature of science, science helps us to be objective about our observations by addressing again only the observable we don't use supernatural explanations. It involves the making, testing, and the evaluating of hypotheses. As we gain more evidence, more information, more discoveries, one of the beautiful things about science is its openness to change. I know sometimes it gets frustrating such as one year you hear you're supposed to eat eggs, the next year, no, you're not, and now again you're supposed to eat eggs. Uh, that is frustrating, but that is that changing nature of science as we learn new things, gain more evidence. Usually it's not so much that you, that a, a data or a evidence could change a whole theory. Usually it's just little parts that we tweak to fit the evidence. Researchers use experiments to unravel complex natural processes by changing one variable at a time. Experiments are designed in a consistent way. Researchers change an independent variable, then observe the effects of change on a dependent variable. This helps to determine a cause and effect relationship in a complex natural system. For instance, how do peacock butterflies defend themselves against predatory birds? Well, we start by making our observations, such as wing flicking shows wing spots, and then the hissing and clicking sounds. So, we make our predictions wing spots scare predators or possibly the sounds deter the other birds. A small sample size increases unfortunately the potential for sampling error. Uh, you're much better off having a large sample size. Researchers design experiments to minimize bias and use probability rules to check statistical significance of results. And science is self-correcting because scientists check and test one another's ideas. That openness to share your work and have others critique you and, and check and recheck is one of the beautiful things of science. Sampling error is a difference between the results derived from testing an entire group of events or individuals and results derived from testing a subset of the group. Probability, the chance that a particular outcome of an event will occur. It does depend on the total number of outcomes possible, such as what is the chance if I flip a coin and I get heads. Well, there's only two outcomes possible, the heads or the tails, so a one out of two chance or one half chance that I would flip a coin and get heads. 
That's an example of probability. Statistically significant refers to a result that is statistically unlikely to have occurred by chance. That there was a reason that it actually did occur. Going back to this slide, I just went back two slides uh, to get us some answers. We're probably wondering here about this uh, wing flicking thing and these hissing and clicking things. Uh, going to our book, they tell us a story about this. Consider the peacock butterfly, a winged insect that was named for the large colorful spots on its wings. In 2005, researchers published a report on their test to identify factors that help peacock butterflies defend themselves against insect-eating insect birds. The researchers made two observations. First, when a peacock butterfly rests, it folds its wings, so only the dark underside shows. Second, when a butterfly sees a predator approaching, it repeatedly flicks its wings open and closed while also moving the hind wings in a way that produces a hissing sound and a series of clicks. The researchers were curious, as all good scientists are, about why the peacock butterfly flicks its wings. After they reviewed earlier studies, they came up with two hypotheses that might explain the wing flicking behavior. Although, uh, number one, wing, wing flicking probably attracts predatory birds, it also exposes brilliant spots that resemble owl eyes. Anything that looks like owl eyes is known to startle small butterfly eating birds, so exposing the wing spots might scare off predators. Number two, the hissing and clicking sounds produced when the peacock butterfly moves its hind wings may be an additional defense that deters predatory birds. The researchers used their hypotheses to make the following predictions. Number one, if peacock butterflies startle predatory birds by exposing their brilliant wing spots, then individuals with wing spots will be less likely to get eaten by the predatory birds than those without wing spots. Number two, if peacock butterfly sounds deter predatory birds, then sound producing individuals will be less likely to get eaten by predatory birds than silent individuals. Well, the next step then was indeed to experiment. The researchers used a marker to paint the wing spots of some butterflies black and scissors to cut off the sound making part of the hind wings of others. A third group had their wing spots painted and their hind wings cut. The researchers then put each butterfly into a large cage with a hungry bird called the blue tit. And then they watch the pair for 30 minutes. Page 15 of your book shows you a picture of these organisms. All of the butterflies with unmodified wing spots survived, regardless of whether they made sounds. By contrast, only half of the butterflies that had their spots painted, painted out but uh, could make sounds survive. Most of the butterflies with neither spots nor sound structures were eaten quickly. The test results confirm both predictions, so they support the hypotheses. Birds are deterred by peacock butterfly sounds and even more so by their wing spots. And you again can see that data on page 15. Let's consider again the sampling error concept. So let's say we have a jar of jelly beans, and in reality, 120 of them are green and 280 are black. Let's say we pull out um, in our experiment just one sample, and the one that we pull out is a green jelly bean. From that one sample, Basically, you're kind of forced to assume then that all jelly beans are green. In reality, uh, we know that's not true, but because of our small sample size of just one jelly bean, the green one, we assume that all are green. Now let's look at that a different way. Uh, let's say that our sample is 50 jelly beans. It's 
we pull 50 of them out of the jar, we get 10 green and 40 black, and then we change that into percentages, and we get 20% green, 80% black. Uh, let's go back a slide and compare 20% green, 80% black. Uh, here's the reality of what it is. This time we're much more close to what the answer really is, to what it really would be in nature by having that larger sample size. Experimenters risk interpreting results in terms of what they want to find out. Uh, experiments should be designed to yield data that can be counted or otherwise measured objectively, meaning we try to eliminate the bias of the person doing the experiment in science. Quantitative data, or data that includes counting or numbers, does help that. Researchers carefully design and carry out experiments in order to unravel cause and effect relationships in complex natural systems. Scientists then helps us be objective about our observations because it's only concerned with testable ideas about observable aspects of nature. Opinion and belief, yes, they do have value in our human culture, but are not addressed by science. And then we arrive at uh, some big words here that we use often in science, a scientific theory I want you to think of that as kind of a huge idea that has uh, tons and tons of data and time backing it. It's our best way of describing reality. Um, but do keep in mind, earlier I, I did mention that science is open to change. As we gather different and more evidence, as we get better technology, make new discoveries, we can actually change scientific theories. Generally, it's not enough to change a whole theory again, but tweak parts of it. We do have uh, certain laws of nature that describe something that occurs without fail, but uh, we may not yet have a complete scientific explanation for it yet. Uh, example of a law of nature that I mentioned earlier was uh, energy can be created and not destroyed. That's one of the laws of thermodynamics. A scientific theory then, hypothesis that's not been disproven after many, many years of rigorous testing. It's held up. Much, much evidence and data gathered that support it. And again, a law of nature is a, a a big generalization that describes a consistent natural phenomena for which there is incomplete scientific explanation, such as our laws of thermodynamics, our laws of planetary motion, Newton's laws of motion. Um, unfortunately, subjective values like morals and beliefs can't be tested by the scientific method and science uh, doesn't address the supernatural or anything beyond nature. When we revisit our, our secret of life here, we've discovered only a small fraction of the species that uh, share Earth with us. And so we can go to new places, we can make new discoveries, we can make new discoveries even in places that we have been. It, uh, kind of opens things up that uh, there's still a lot out there that it's not explained yet. We need people who can think critically and work scientifically to help answer all those questions that we still have. Some other take-home messages I'd like to leave with you, like why does science work? Well, science has built-in checks and balances that help us to be objective about our observations. Because a scientific theory is revised until no one can prove it wrong, 
It is our best way of describing reality. On page 19, they leave us with a little example of an organism that was discovered. It says, of an estimated 100 billion species that have ever lived, at least 100 million are still with us today. That number is only an estimate because we're still discovering them by the thousands every year. For example, a return expedition to New Guinea's Foha Mountains turned up a mouse-sized possum and a cat-sized rat. And they have some pictures on page 19 of that. Very cute. Other uh, surveys revealed lemurs and sucker-footed bats in Madagascar, birds in the Philippines, monkeys in Tanzania, Brazil and India, cave-dwelling spiders and insects in two of California's national parks. That's a little closer to home there. Carnivorous sponges near Antarctica, whales, sharks, giant jelly-like animals, fish, and other aquatic light, uh, wildlife, and scores of plants and single-celled organisms. Most were discovered by biologists who were simply trying to find out what lives where. Biologists make discoveries every day, though we may never hear of them. Each new species they discover is another reminder that we do not yet know all of the organisms on our own planet. We don't even know how many to look for. The vast information about the 1.8 million species we do know about changes so quickly that collating it has been impossible until recently. A new website titled the Encyclopedia of Life is intended to be an online reference source and database of species information that's maintained by collaborative effort. Uh, you can see its progress at www.eol.org.